Okay, welcome back to The Daily Mastermind. My name is George Wright III with your daily dose of inspiration, motivation, and education so that you can create your ultimate destiny. We are joined today, boy, I'll tell you what, you are gonna be blown away with what we're gonna be offering today. We're joined by a, a good friend, past colleague, Dr. William Danko. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, George. It's been a while, right? We've, uh, we've worked together many times over the years and, and have known each other and, and reconnected. And I'll tell you what, I'm super glad to have you here because your message, your timing, your latest book couldn't come at a more opportune time. And I appreciate you scheduling me into your, uh, your fun lifestyle that you have up in the Adirondacks and, and <laughs> up in upstate New York. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to get you uh, tied down, but it, it, I'm sure we'll get into some of that today. So thank you so much for being here. Glad to be here. Let me do this for those of uh, our listeners that do not know you, that maybe um, have heard of your work, have heard of your stuff, or I've talked about you and mentioned you in past podcasts. Let me just do a quick introduction because many of them know you as the co-author of The Millionaire Next Door, uh, New York Times bestseller for over three years, but I'm going to give them a little bit of your background. So, you know, after 31 years on the marketing faculty, nine as the chair, you received um, the emeritus status in 2007 at the School of Business, State University of New York at Albany. And during your tenure, uh, studied consumer behavior, in particular, the topic of wealth, which is a very high topic for this, this podcast. But as the author of The Millionaire Next Door, a research-based book about wealth in America, um, that really, I mean, this thing just crushed it for years and years and years. We actually uh, featured it quite a bit in our events over time. But you've most recently written uh, and co-authored a book called Richer Than a Millionaire, A Pathway to True Prosperity, which we'll talk about today. But I know your academic uh, publications and career have, ex have, have spanned the globe. I mean, uh, Journal of Consumer Research, Journal of Business Research, Journal of Advertising Research, and, and many, many others. But you've also spoken and presented to, to, to crowds, groups, select individuals um, in you know, the U.S. and all over Australia, Canada, Germany, Poland, Switzerland, Taiwan. So you earned your uh, Ph.D., and, uh, and that was at Polytech Institute, correct? Right. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Yes. RPI for short. Oh, that's awesome. Nobody, and, no, cause nobody can say Rensselaer. That's the problem. Nobody can spell it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I do know is you are an expert when it comes to studying uh, human behavior as well as wealth building. And that's, that's the reason I wanted to have you on our um, on our podcast and we had a call. It's funny because we had a call uh, a week or so ago and both of us looked at each other afterwards and wished we had just pressed record on the mic because that would have made an amazing podcast. So we'll do our best to try to uh, regroup and readdress some of these amazing topics we talked about. I, I really enjoyed that. So with, with no further ado, I, I really appreciate you being here and I hope that we can um, do what we can to just kind of get some golden nuggets from you. So with that introduction, maybe you could give us just a little bit um, of your background into not just your, your career, but what, what took you into this specific direction of, um, you know, wealth and, and, and looking at consumer behavior and individual entrepreneur behavior, which kind of led to the first book. And then what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the me and next door and then, and then gravitate into the more recent book, the one I'd like to discuss, which is Richer Than a Millionaire. So maybe give us a little bit of your background so people know you more. Yeah, no, fair enough. That's uh, a good way to start. You know, it goes back to 1973 when I was a mere undergraduate student. And one of my professors was Professor Thomas J. Stanley. And it was a good course in consumer behavior. It, uh, it was like a sociology course. But uh, we developed a relationship and uh, he encouraged me to uh, continue my studies, which I did, got my PhD at RPI subsequently. But from 1973 to 1993, um, I was still in upstate New York and Tom went down to uh, Georgia to become a professor at uh, Georgia State University. And we kept in touch doing a number of consulting studies and academic studies over the years. It was it was good. And in 1993, that was a pivotal year. He called me up and said, do you still have the uh, old data sets 
from you know various uh, financial institutions that we consulted for, and I did. And he says, well, let's reanalyze the data and create a an over uh, um, encompassing umbrella uh, survey. And uh, and we did so. It was a academic study. We self funded all this. This is before either of us were rich and famous. We were just struggling <laughs> academics. <laughs> and I said, "Holy smoke! You know, I have a young family. He has a young family." But the point is, the concept sounded good. And the it, as we were developing uh, the manuscript, the running title was uh, "Big Hat No Cattle." Yeah, and exactly. the, which is a lot of the, entrepreneurs the, nowadays, right? <laughs> yeah, well, th there's a lot of people who have the illusion of wealth. Yep. You know, but yep. they, they have the big car, the nice neighborhood, they have all the trappings, but they're on this economic treadmill. Yeah. And uh, so with the survey research, we found that there were some what we call uh, industrial strength neighborhoods looking at their zip codes. And there were some people in the trades and farming, you know, plumbing and carpentry and uh, uh, car salesmen and car car dealership owners, not what you would call the professions like, you know, law or engineering or medicine, yeah. the so-called right places to uh, make a living. The um, but, So we found that there are a number of very well-off people in these lesser neighborhoods and they had jobs working with their hands for the most part and as opposed to being the so-called uh, uh, elite college educated beautiful people yeah so so that's how it, it evolved and then over that 20 year period from 1973 to uh, 1993 we had looked at irs data census data all of our survey research data personal interviews and we had something called convergent validity, which means we have these various sources of truth converging to give us the basic uh, premise of what became the millionaire next door, how ordinary people can uh, really achieve uh, substantial uh, net worth. Okay, so that's how that book evolved. Then... Okay. Well, and, and I wanted to kind of point out, it's interesting because a lot of people just grow up around this idea of I want to be a millionaire and this is what I want. This is why I want it. And and they don't really have any clue. And, and not only do they not have any clue, but they think they know what a millionaire really is. They think they know yeah. what it takes to be there. And a lot of times it's, it's, a, it's a vision and a dream and a plan that really has no basis behind it. So it's really interesting some of the things in that first book that really yeah, pull that yeah, out. Yeah. So, Exactly. So, you know, in The Millionaire Next Door, I mean, if you had, if I had to summarize it, there's a lot of quiet wealth. There's not a lot of flash on these ordinary millionaires. And one thing that we discovered um, in that survey, but in also in subsequent surveys, 80% of the millionaires in our country are first generation wealthy, <laughs> which mm -hmm. means they earned it on their own. And one of the, the hallmarks of, of wealth generation is to be an early and consistent saver so you can be an investor. In fact, many are small business owners. You know, when I look at, um, you know, some of the ways that uh, uh, millionaires became that way, they often have multiple streams of income. They may have their day job, which we call the active income, no matter right. what they're doing. Yeah. But they also do things like... Um, they may own a, a billboard company or storage units, or they may own parking lots where they're charging people just to place their car for the day. Yep. Um, one of the more colorful ones, um, uh, I, I interviewed uh, a guy who owns two trailer parks. And I said, well, what's the story there? He says, well, I have this piece of developed land with utilities on it. and the person who's living there owns their own trailer. And so if they don't pay the rent on time, I have a whole new definition of rolling stock. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, you that know, is so it, funny. It, there are some states, as you, know, you point out, I live in New York State, and uh, being in the rental business in, in housing can be uh, quite uh, burdensome. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a law for everything. And I think California is the same way. There's a yeah. lot of tenant rights. Now, we don't yeah. want to abuse tenants. Don't get me wrong. 
Yeah. But boy, if you could have a parking lot, or <laughs> you can so, uh, you, you know, do things that are pretty passive uh, to make money. Uh, but that's a, that's that, a common that, characteristic, right? I mean, like the, of these of these millionaires, there's everyday people just like us, but they had a side hustle, they had a side thing, they had. Right you know, something else going on. And I also want to make sure I mention what you, you, I don't, I don't want to pass up what you said a minute ago that they're early savers or that they they treat things a certain way. Because one thing we talk a lot about on our podcast is how you do anything is how you do everything. You can't be someone that's going to manage money. If you mismanage money along the way, these are, these are principles and characteristics and traits that you have to adopt early on. And that was a common characteristic of people that were truly not, not millionaires, but net worth millionaires that were worth some money. Correct. No, th this is true. Um, they're good stewards of their resources. That's for sure. In fact, there's this concept called uh, self-imposed economic scarcity. And this became clear in the millionaire next door Let's say you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year, but you spend a hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> um, you're just on an economic treadmill, right? You're never going to get ahead. But yeah. what if you get, what if you get between your ears the notion of I am going to systematically save and invest twenty percent of whatever I make and live on eighty percent of whatever I make. So if you could, right now in America, the typical household is saving about 8% of their discretion, of their income as discretionary income. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily long-term saving. That could right. be part of their emergency fund or something they're going to spend quickly on tuition or, or some other. Uh, it can go really purpose. fast. Yeah, really fast. And it sure can. Yeah. But if you can have the attitude of saying, I'm going to take 20% and have a long-term investment portfolio, um, and I prefer, you know, low load uh, mutual funds, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't give investment advice, but I, right, right, right. I do, need, the, the, the fewer uh, uh, expenses you have, the better off you are. Yeah, but you know what's sure. interesting? You you say that, and that's an amazing point because I love the term self-imposed economic scarcity, meaning stop spending everything you make. And, and not only because from a standpoint of if you were to save more, you can invest more and eventually solve the problem of having more than you're currently getting. But, you know, a lot of thought leaders today say that same thing a little bit differently where they say, listen, um, everyone complains they can't get that side business, that side, you know, mobile home park or real estate or, you know, billboards or whatever going. But, you know, if, if you just spent a little less money, you could fund your side business. So whether it's an active income, a passive income or investments, I think that strategy by itself, Bill, is huge. I think that is, that's a huge strategy people need to learn. And it's hard because nowadays people feel like they need to put on the show of being a millionaire to ever attract what they need in their life. But that is not what time has proven to create millionaires. That's right. And this is why in our survey research, you know, the typical millionaire or the, when you become um, uh, really economically self-sufficient, you're in your 50s. Uh, That's why, because you, you have know, to learn that lesson over time. I mean, what? <laughs> learn, well, the learn that way? lesson, but, but it's, uh, it's a steady as you go approach. Here's Got the it. problem. There are, there are people in their 50s are saying, well, gee, in 10 years or 20 years, I want to retire. Maybe I should start saving. Mm. Well, we have to get this notion of compounding interest working in our favor, yeah. right? Yeah. And the, the earlier you start, the more compounding you have. Um, so, so it's, it's interesting because uh, you used to, you, you've spoken for me many, many times on stages at our asset protection events. And we talk about things that the high net worth know, but the average person could implement like, you know, uh, reduction in your taxes is about as quick and safe and effective way to have extra money to invest with as anything else. But people don't spend time on that either. So clearly the knowledge and the the learning needs to increase and it needs to increase as at, at as young an age as possible. So I love the concept. And, you know, there's, there's a reason that uh, Millionaire Next Door was a New York Times bestseller for years and years and years um, is because of that. Is there anything else? Um, I, and I know that you took some updates to that bridging into the next topic, but I, yeah. let's, let's go whichever direction you want to go with that because but, I know you had a yeah, transition. Yeah. Maybe one or two uh, additional points here. Um, okay. 
you know, also millionaires tend to avoid excessive debt. Now, there are mm. some that are very highly leveraged, that's for sure. Right. However, there's uh, the admonition in the book of Proverbs from the Bible, chapter 22, verse 7. The borrower is a slave to the lender. When you are in debt, you are a slave. Mm -hmm. So when you have a house with a mortgage that, again, you're, you're, you, you have that beautiful neighborhood and the beautiful car, and, and you have a wall-to-wall -wall mortgage, and you have car payments that are excessive, yeah. um, you know, you're a slave. You can't quit working. Well, and doesn't what that's, you, that's literally, literally the definition of stress and anxiety and, and all those things, right? You think you're getting all these things to feel better, but you're a slave to them. You're, you're, money, you're a slave to money. Money's not working for you. Yeah. And, you know, when, when I reflect on you know, my academic uh, thinking about this, you know, in sociology, we, when we talk about social class, and I'm not so sure that's a relevant construct anymore, but social class has a couple of elements, including, you know, what neighborhood do you live in and how do you make a living? So if you're a physician living in a very nice neighborhood, well, you have a higher social status. But if you're a, a plumber living in a blue collar neighborhood, but have a lot of money <laughs> and you may have a very nice net worth, you have a lower social status. And for some reason, we got into our heads in our American society that it's better to be an upper class person. Well, the millionaire next door kind of dismisses that idea, saying, wait a minute, who am I trying to impress? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather have satisfaction that I can say I could quit my job if I wanted to, if I wanted to, but I can do things on my own terms. And that's you know, the real advantage of being that millionaire and being economically uh, self-sufficient, that I now have the ability to act in a way that few people can stop me from doing. Okay. So, I love that concept, that by the way, you said stop impressing other people. I, I think that that's huge because the irony of that is if let's say you take two individuals that make the same amount of money, let's say they make six figures and one of them lives in a blue collar neighborhood or one of them lives in a high end neighborhood, the guy making a hundred thousand bucks that's living at the top of his social circle and the, probably has a lot less stress than the guy that's living at the bottom end of his social circle with the exact same amount of money. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And, you know, it, it, and before we leave the topic of uh, the millionaire next door, there's one chapter in particular about economic outpatient care, EOC, and what it means to support an adult child. Um, and you could have children 30, 40, 50 years of, old, uh, years a, years of age mm -hmm. still on the dole, uh, and they depend on their parents' uh, largesse. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had the opportunity to uh, you know, speak at some high net worth conferences that were lunches that had the parents and the children attend the same lunch oh, wow. because they wanted, to hear, they wanted to hear about that EOC chapter. The parents loved it and the children, well, they were less enthused about getting the message about being. <laughs> yeah, about so this, being is, this is basically <laughs> kids codependent on their parents still, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So what's a nugget now, from that? What did you, what, what, what would you say to the audience of this podcast about that? Because yeah, that's a, that's a, that's yeah. a thing right now, obviously. Yeah. It, it's, it really comes down to tough love, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, you're not doing the kid any favor by making them economically dependent. In fact, look, I have uh, three kids and five grandkids. I know you have a number of children yourself. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and as a parent and grandparent, I always think about, well, what do I want for my children? I, I don't want them to be screw ups. I don't want them to go to jail. I don't want them to be on drugs. And I want them to be economically self-sufficient where, where I am not going to be subsidizing their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Now, look, to, to be fair, um, you know, I made sure my kids got out of uh, undergraduate school uh, debt free. I, you know, and and now they're launched. Two of them have PhDs, courtesy of the companies they work for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, all, and all three are gainfully employed in the professions. None of them are marketers. My wife's an occupational therapist. None of them are, are in medicine. Um, one's a mathematician and two are engineers. And I love it. They're 
they're economically self-sufficient and they they got the message and i and i think probably one of the things that they got the <laughs> you know when my kids were young and all they do is see me study and we didn't have a lot of money they grew up without money so they never yeah. needed money yeah and you know so it was really good well you know it's you know, interesting because well go, go finish go ahead and finish your thought Okay. Yeah, yeah. Warren Buffett, you know, had a good point about this, about, you know, well, what's the sense of having money if you can't, you know, spend it on the kids? He says, well, give your children enough so that they can do anything, but not so much they can do nothing. Yeah, so, so not so much it, that they will do nothing, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, you know, you hear about the trust fund babies and, you know, Oh man, they don't have to do anything because they're special, right? <laughs> well, yeah, but the thing is that's crazy about today's entrepreneurs and, and I think it can work both ways, both with parents supporting their kids, but also with kids that are going is one of the biggest principles we talk about on the Daily Mastermind is I create my life. And so if you are a kid living at home or you're, you're, you're dependent too much on someone else, anyone else, especially parents, you know, you're not creating your own economy. You're not creating your own destiny. You're codependent. And so... It's not of benefit regardless. And so instilling those things from a parental point of view and then claiming that ability and proactive responsibility to, to create your life for the kids are both very, very sound principles. So I think that's really, really a, a good thing. And I'll have to go back and check out that, that as well because that EOC, I think, applies to both the parents and the kids and it, and it does create anxiety and depression and things because when you're not in control of your life you're going to be stressed out and when you're feeling like you're supporting others and they're not taking the ball you're going to be stressed as well so that's a that's a tough thing for both sides and, and the and the problem is it all starts out innocently enough you know you don't want to sure. see junior sleeper yeah. you know so you subsidizing and more and more and more you know, Sometimes you just um, got to rip the Band-Aid off because you're right. It starts out <laughs> simple enough, but it never ends up simple enough when you get to that point where it's like, all right, what do we do now? You know? Yeah. Okay. So those well, are, let's talk. Yeah. Let's kind of go to the next, go to the next uh, uh, kind of phase of your life and through the books and the second book, because I know you've had, um, you know, some personal story that's kind of gravitated and led you to writing your second uh, bestseller there, Richer Than a Millionaire. So let's talk about that for a minute. Oh, that's right. Um, you know, 2015 was a, a pivotal year in so many ways. Um, um, one, Tom Stanley died in a car crash. Um, and two, my uh, quadriplegic brother that my wife and I uh, were keeping out of a nursing home for 20 years uh, died that same year. Um, and it was only two years later after that, that his cat died. And then you're really free. <laughs> Jeez. Well, and you took care of him. You were, you mentioned this a second ago, but you took care of your brother. I mean, this is, this yeah. is no small you know, commitment. Uh, yeah. And I, but, and I do it again in a heartbeat. Now in 1996 or 1995, my mother, who was the caregiver to my brother uh, had a stroke and she couldn't take care of him anymore. So um, fortunately, I you know had a career as a university professor. Then the royalty started coming in. I was able to buy my brother a house, keep him out of a nursing home, and uh, my wife and I, you know, <laughs> well, we were the primary caregivers for 20 years. Hmm. And every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, because it's so hard to get a weekend aid, and I had to cut the grass sometime. Mm -hmm. So. I would be the I would be the personal aide on the Fridays as well as Saturdays and Sundays, and get to talk to a guy um, who couldn't even scratch his nose. Okay, I mean he was a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. Wow. And and uh, you know he manifested MS at the age of 23, right out of uh, getting out of college, mm, and then by the time he was 68. Well, like three years after that, he was in a wheelchair. And by the time he was 68, when he died, he was a total quadriplegic. And yeah, he had to feed him, bathe him, dress him. Anyway, I would do it again in a heartbeat, no question. Um, but boy, it gives you a perspective about life that I think few people have. Not I mean, bad. everybody thinks everything is, uh, you know, you know, roses out there. And uh, gee, all I have to do is... Uh, you know, do my thing. Well, 
when you start doing something for somebody else and having that greater purpose, it really is uh, uh, the basis of, of what the uh, richer than a millionaire uh, came to be. So I still had a social life. Um, and I would confer with one of my colleagues in upstate New York, uh, Richard Van Ness. And uh, then as we were driving, we would chat about what kind of legacy do we want to leave our children and grandchildren. And uh, we started taking notes and uh, really became this, the, the, the backbone for uh, richer than a millionaire, you know, because he had, um, you know, like everybody has tragedies in their life and uh, he uh, had some as well, and um, he um, coped, and I coped. And on top of that, between us, we had over 50 years of teaching experience at the college level. And we said, you know, we got to start teaching our students this stuff, and we have to, uh, you know, start teaching our own children and grandchildren. So well, it's it really interesting that you say that because, uh, you know, it's also currently in our economy and in our marketplace, this whole concept of fulfillment and happiness and things, which we'll get into, has become so much more. But here you are, you mentioned to me before, I think you, you guys had studied over 15,000 students, and now your filter is starting to change, his filter starting to change, and you're, you're realizing what other people are searching for is that it, there is more than just money and you are also trying to figure out how you're going to leave a legacy. And, but these are all topics that I think people are really searching for answers for right now. So I, I, I think that that's amazing that you happen to be in a position where you had literally studied and worked with individuals, thousands and thousands of students and things like that, where you could affect them, but also you could really get a sense of what people thought, how their mind was going and stuff. Correct. Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, and of course, at a school of business and teaching, you know, students, it's about, okay, this is what you got to do to get a job. These are, this is yeah. the attitude you need to have. This is how you acquire money. You know, you know I, I taught marketing and marketing research. And when I think about this, holy smoke, this is what we do to extract money from people in exchange for something else. <laughs> yeah, it is, funny. It, it is funny to note, I'll bring up, you know, you weren't just a professor. You're a professor in business and marketing and wealth. So it's interesting. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, it, so we started talking about a classic essay from 1758 by Benjamin Franklin. Um, he wrote it under the pseudonym um, Richard Saunders, as in poor Richard's almanac. Mm. And it's called The Way to Wealth. And I encourage your listeners to uh, Google The Way to Wealth. It's a 3,500 word essay. Some of the English is a little stilted. But when you look at the, uh, the lessons, I mean, basically, uh, Ben Franklin says that 90% of the reason that you don't have money is because of you. <laughs> wow. He says 10% 10 is government and taxes and, you know, the friction in society. It's about motivation. And I, I really believe that. In fact, there was a, a book that came out in the year 2000 um, called uh, Radical Innovation uh, by the Harvard Press. And if I could just share something with your listeners yeah. about this, uh, the, the question was, well, where do blockbusters come from? You know, the, the next new thing, the, the, right. be, the next thing that's going to make a lot of people rich. And uh, what the authors found in this uh, radical innovation book was that they were hoping to find it was group think where, you know, you had an organization that was working on a common problem. If I could just read a quote here, I have it happen to have it on my desk. Yeah, for sure. However, we found we found just the opposite. Radical innovation was primarily driven by individual initiative. We were surprised by the lack of corporate attention. Ha! Huh. What this means is, wow. you know, there's somebody who is going to be the spark that's going to create an industry. I mean, look at Elon Musk. I mean, he has some quirky habits, but boy, what a genius he is. Yeah, there's a million happen. of those examples, right? I mean, you're talking, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, there's just, there's just a ton yeah. of them because 
it's an individual yeah, that sparks Bezos. it, right? Yeah, Bezos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bezos. Yeah, that's and, a great. Um, that's a great point, and it's so funny because those are principles that are time proven, right? What the mind of man can conceive and believe it can achieve, and it doesn't say what you know, everybody gets together and figures out could be the next big thing is, you know, so that's a really, really good point. That book is Radical Innovation, you said? Yeah, it came out in 2000, uh, Harvard Press. Mm. Uh, Richard Leifer uh, is the lead author. There's several authors on it, uh, but love it. Leifer is uh, the first author. Okay. So, so obviously, so, so obviously, individuals can make a huge effect. They can create their own economy. They they need to do things that are principles that are taught in the millionaire next door. But as you get into richer than a millionaire, what's what's the real yeah. key point yeah. that these books now, are going to bring us to? Now, in 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 Franklin's way to wealth, mm -hmm. he makes it clear that being industrious and frugal and prudent these are all good things, and he says as he continues his thought, but all of it is blasted without a blessing from heaven, and therefore ask that blessing humbly, and be not uncharitable to those in need. Okay, so he's bringing the charity dimension here, and doing things for the good of others. Mm -hmm. hmm. He says, now, industry, prudent, and uh, being frugal are all good things. And the millionaire next door makes that clear. But what we wanted to test in the new book and richer than a millionaire is, does it matter if you're charitable? Well, again, Franklin from 1758 said it was important, but guess who else said it was important? <laughs> how, about the gospel, but how about the gospel of Matthew and Christianity, Matthew oh, wow. 25? Hmm. That which you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. What about in Judaism, in chapter 58, when it talks about giving your coat to those who have no coat, do not turn your back on the hungry. And even in Islam, one of the five pillars of Islam is almsgiving, being charitable. And so we have established religion saying being charitable is important. We have Ben Franklin from 1758 says, don't forget to be charitable because it, because he's talking about the way to wealth and that's mm -hmm. where we're coming in true yeah. prosperity. Yep. And so we did the survey research where we look specifically at that, the, the uh, issue. Of course, we measure things like household net worth. We also measure charitable activity in terms of how much do you donate? How many hours do you give? on a volunteer basis? Do you practice the golden rule of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you? Mm -hmm. And then we also have another construct from the psychology literature called subjective well-being, SWB, uh, created by uh, Professor Ed Diener and his colleagues in the psychology uh, literature. And he created a valid and reliable scale where we can measure, well, how happy are you? How well adjusted are you? And so using his scale, which fortunately is in the public domain, so we can use it freely, mm -hmm. but it, I, I, I happen to know because people ask, well, it's on page 94 of Richer Than a Millionaire. You know, you can actually score yourself. But the way it works is this. If you score low on the scale, you're basically considered, well, less well adjusted or unhappy and if you score high on the scale which well fortunately i do actually um you're considered to be pretty well adjusted and so here's the basic premise you know money is good but money and happiness is better <laughs> that's a really good, good point because how many people do we know that like <laughs> that have that same issue and, and if you're only chasing the wealth without the happiness a lot of times you end up getting you just get that without the happiness, right? So, yeah, it, 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 exactly. In fact, what we demonstrate through our survey research, okay, put a little uh, benchmark here. Okay. In the United States right now, $50,000 is the median net worth. No, uh, no excuse me, $100,000 is the 50th percentile, the median percentile okay. um, for net worth in America. So, half have less than 100,000. In fact, that less than 100,000 includes negative net worth. Mm. But 
and half have over 100,000. Okay. And so when we were doing the survey, we looked at only those with more than $100,000 net worth. And we find there's a group between 100,000 and a million, which we call the up and comers, or the ones that are probably going to make it if they just practice some of these principles okay. of uh, wealth creation. And then we had others uh, above the million dollar threshold, and it was uh, um, um, about $3 million, was $3.2 million uh, in net worth for the uh, those with more above. than a million dollar worth. Okay. Yeah. So you're studying yeah. two groups. You're taking the half above 100,000 and they're kind of split into two groups, people that have a net worth of 100,000 to a million and, and a group of people that have a million or more are the two groups, right? Exactly. Okay. Right. And then we look at, okay, how happy are you? And so we have of the those up and comers between 100,000 and a million dollars, we find that... Um, 73% would consider themselves pretty happy, pretty well adjusted. Conversely, 27% are unhappy. And you can say, well, all right, I can see that they might have expenses and 100,000 is good, but it's not great. But <laughs> relatively speaking, you're in the top half of all households. Mm -hmm. So you are better off than you think. And, uh, and in the millionaire group, we find that 88% are pretty well adjusted and 12% mm. are discontent. And so now this gives us, because we have mutually exclusive groups, the opportunity to contrast and compare the characteristics of the happy versus the unhappy. Mm, okay. And of course, this is outlined in the book. And so here we have correlates. I wish we could talk about causality, but you know, if we had a sponsor, who could fund a longitudinal study for 20 years with multiples of millions of dollars. We could do <laughs> right. this. Right, right, right. <laughs> so well, so we, so we basically have to settle for what are the top reasons that these people are unhappy yeah. or happy, right? So we'll, we'll yeah, start with exactly. that because so, if we could prevent it by cause, that'd be great. But at least, at least if yeah. we can figure out what'll change it, right? You, yes, it'll give us, I mean, you know, a lot of medical studies are done this way, you know, with survey research. They said, well, we don't have causality here, but there's an association and it warrants further study. And I agree. But when you look at the preponderance of evidence and, and what I'm going to say next, you know, the golden rule of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, practicing that and being happy are positive, positively correlated with each other. Got it. Giving money, giving money to charity, the more you give, the happier you are. More hours you spend volunteering, the more you volunteer and integrate yourself into some organization, the happier you are. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I, I also looked at in this survey is, uh, do you belong to an organized religion? Now, the Gallup organization at the time when the survey was done said that 85% of all adults in America claim to have a formal religion. And uh, this particular uh, uh, research, it was about 90%. So it's not so different from uh, the, the population as a whole. Got it. And so, well, if you belong to a religion, then you got it made, right? Well, what we find is 90% of the dissatisfied belong to a religion and 90% of the satisfied belong to a religion. Mm. When we ask further questions, okay, even if you belong to a religion or not, a question, are you at peace with your soul? Mm. And this really gets to the, to the nub, doesn't it? Because you know when you have that uneasy feeling right. that you're not at peace you don't know where you're going, you're in debt, you, you know, just have a lot of anxiety. In fact, we ask, are you anxious about the future? <laughs> what we find is those who are at peace tend to be satisfied. Those who are not anxious tend to be satisfied. And the overarching question, is God central to your life? Yes or no. Mm. And those who say yes tend to be in the satisfied group. 
So I got, I got to tell you something. Stuff. I got to, I, yeah, it is. And I, I want to kind of highlight some of that really quick because from, from my perspective, you, you said some amazing things I want to make note of. And that is that all the stuff leading up to this book that you read, whether it's from, you know, Benjamin Franklin or some of the research and things you did is that it started to correlate towards, you know, charity, giving, you know, service. And this is a lot, this is a difficult concept for people because law of attraction and knowing that you give to give, you don't give to get, you give to give and it will come back, you know, 10 times is something you've heard since you were a child, but it's correlating to more happiness and more wealth and all the above. But you're saying that when you looked at the people that were under a million in net worth and over a million in net worth, you know, there, there was a strong correlation that, you know, 90% of them had an organized type religion, but it didn't necessarily dictate whether they were happy, unhappy. But when you started to add these things, I, I made a note here that you were less anxious about the future, that you had, um, you know, God as a presence in your life and that you had, you were at peace with your soul. These are things yeah. that I think happen through the give charity service and stuff. And so I really love that. And it's not, it's not something that's completely mutually exclusive from business, but it's an avenue that most people don't look at. They just hear, make more money, make more money. Because I, when you said those stats, I said to myself, well, you're actually telling me 73% are happy in the under million, but 88 are over the million. The first thing I thought was, well, obviously making more money was a correlate, right? But, and, mm -hmm. and maybe, that, maybe it's not that it's not, but, but the point is the happiness piece, why not have both, right? Exactly right. You see, um, man, I think this goes back even to the 1958 essay by Earl Nightingale called The Strangest Secret. I love that. You one. know, love yeah. It, yes. And, you know, one of the metaphors he uses is he, the man says to the wood burning stove, give me heat, then I will give you wood. Right. Well, what he's really saying is you must be a giver before you can get. And so in business, from the Earl Nightingale lesson, I, he was a religious man, but his metaphor of you got to give before you get, you know, and it's the right thing to do. I, well, I got to tell you, you I'm going to stop you there because I just barely caught that because I've always taken that analogy as you got to be willing to do the work to get the reward. You've got to put the fuel in to get the, the heat. But you just said something I think makes a huge amount of sense. And that is, it's the simple act of you got to give it to get it. And, and, you know, and that's huge. I love that. And you're right. I think that goes back to pretty much as a man thinketh, the golden secret, I mean, strange secret. I mean, pretty much everything I've read now, it takes on sort of a both meaning, right? You got to put in the work, you got to have a path, you got to have a plan to get the reward. But it's the act of giving that you also have to have the faith will get you what you're looking for, right? Yeah, it, it, it's really having a purpose greater than yourself saying, it, look, mm. I, I got to do the work. I got to give the wood. <laughs> I, I got to put the effort in. But, you know, it also touches upon um, war itself. Now, why am I bringing up war? You know, I, I read a speech by General Douglas, Douglas MacArthur um, from 1935 when he was addressing his uh, World War I veterans at a reunion. And they talked about the concept of what's in your heart and how can we avoid war in the future? And this is a concept that's not fully explored in the current book, but it's, it's something that it's going to be in a, a new version of uh, Richer Than a Billionaire. It's a concept called metanoia, M-E-T-A-N-O-I-A. -E metanoia is a sincere transformation of the heart. And when General MacArthur was addressing his soldiers, he says, you know, human conflict is not going to be eradicated through institutions and the government and politicians. You know, importantly, he said, and it gets back to that, uh, the individual concept, it could only be reformed through the individual human being. It has to come from within. It's you have to internalize that it is good to practice the golden rule. It is good to be a giver. It is good to be engaged in a society 
is having a more important role than just you and your own money and your own house and your own car. It's really, what is the greater good? And that's I really, really like the, that. I, I really, really and, like that. And that's really the key lesson here in, um, in uh, Richer Than a Millionaire. You know what's um, funny? And I got to ask you this question because I, I think from, from a lot of people right now, because they're just getting pounded with social media and messaging that, you know, have a side hustle, grind, get, you know, get the success, get the success. You can do anything, make it happen. And I think some people from that perspective might be hearing, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. What you're saying is I may get to that point and, and lack the happiness. And so I should also be searching for things that are important. But I think what I'm getting out of this is number one, yes, think about the end game. Think about wanting happiness and fulfillment because you truly can have both. But I'm also getting that the irony is that giving and charity and service and and having that other piece actually will bring you more success and it will bring you more results in the process that's the part i think people don't sometimes get is that it's not just an end game correlate it's actually a path to the game sometimes don't you think that's right and it's and it's something that's internalized at a young age and it becomes part of who you are and you're just a well a better citizen aren't you you know, um, too many times we get isolated with our electronic toys and we don't know our next door neighbor and, you know, church attendance is down. Social groups like Kiwanis is, is, on, the, is on the way out as well. You know, there's just a lot of uh, alienation people have. They're not um, connected. They're just not connected not, anymore like they can they're, be. Yeah. They're, not, they're not connected. And, and that is uh, a real issue. I mean, we can't solve all society's problems, but <laughs> I think if we had a more connected world, we'd be all better off. Well, it's also probably why so many people are focused on the logical, tactical, strategic ways to be successful because there's less of that human interaction, right? So the human interaction is a big piece of it. But one common theme I'm finding when I talk to individuals and entrepreneurs or even thought leaders like yourself is that more and more uh, people realize and they understand that it's not the destination, it's the journey, right? And those types of things. And mm -hmm. so what, what, what I think your message really rings true to on is why not enjoy the destin or the journey? Why not enjoy? And you will, from a pure happiness level, you will enjoy the journey more if things that you're working on and have included in your daily rituals or your practicality is, is things that correlate to happiness, like giving and service and, and um, you know, charity work and things like that. That actually helps you to enjoy the, the journey while also contributing to your success. So it's a great message. I really love that. Do you have any practical, like strategic things that from your, your correlation to studying people that were happy, that specifically that they did along the way or that they instilled in their lives to to really bring, you know, when you talk about giving yep. and charity and service, anything in particular you could suggest? Well, 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 well one thing, and especially um, you know, what I address uh, young students, you know, just uh, a mere a little bit above 20 years of age, they all want to get a new car. And um, I said, well, look, let's talk about the time value of money and ask yourself, you know, do you need a $90,000 car or how about a $30,000 well depreciated car? You know, yeah. it still can be a luxury car, yeah. but well depreciated. Let somebody give you the gift of early depreciation. And so that extra $60,000 in a very practical sense uh, can be used for other purposes like long-term investments. And, you know, it all comes down to, you know, so, so a very practical sense of frugality, I don't think should ever go out of style. It's, um, it, you know, if you could save that 20%, you know, the economic, yeah, yeah. uh, self-imposed economic scarcity. If you can buy good used uh, automobiles and be a long-term investor with l multiple streams of income. But there's also on a personal side, when we talk about being a good steward of resources, yeah, you want to have insurance policies and you want to have your corporate and maybe limited liability companies for, uh, you know, for, legal protections, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but what about your personal relationships? Yeah. You know, and personal habits. 
you know, one of the things that is so costly, there's a, a, a local attorney with a commercial that says marriage is grand, divorce is 20 grand. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I, I hear you there. And it, can, and it can be a lot more expensive than that. But other than the financial impact, the emotional impact can be substantial. In fact, the uh, Center for Disease Control did a study and it looked at, they looked at death certificates of those who died after the age of 50 and they looked at their uh, marital status at the time of death. And they found that those who were married at the time of death lived the longest, and those who were divorced lived the least long, and those who were never married lived or somewhere in between those two groups. So when you look at the opportunity for compounding of your money, just by having a relationship that's long-term and stable is certainly going to encourage you. Well, I think you make a great point about connection, though, too. I mean, you know, most of us are so heavily, you know, involved with creating content online or doing things online, it takes you the opposite direction of the connection. So bringing that connection piece back into your, your goals and your routines and your vision of where you want your life to be, you're saying has an impact not only on you, your happiness level, but on your economics as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and with all those good habits, you know, you know, I, I would encourage everyone to continue being charitable and never forget to be charitable because there's always going to be others that you meet who are going to be a lot worse off than you. That's for sure. Well, okay, I'll now, tell you. With all, go ahead. Oh, with all this said, uh, I want to go back to um, Benjamin Franklin's 1758 essay on the way to wealth. One of the concluding paragraphs is, after all this good advice is given that we just talked about this during this past period, he concludes by saying, the people heard the advice, agreed with it, and then practiced the contrary. <laughs> that isn't that it the is, truth? That that yeah. is it's actually the truth with almost every piece of wisdom that's out there today. People they don't they don't see it and not get it. They see it and they agree with it and they get it, but they don't yeah, do it. Because it. Yeah, because they say change is hard. Change is hard. I get it. But if you're really serious about being uh, richer than a millionaire, uh, <laughs> you, you got to start internalizing this stuff. Oh man, that's an amazing way to, to to end this podcast. And yeah, I wish we weren't out of time because this is such a great topic. I, I, I want to just kind of come back and circle back to the very first thing that, that you kind of said. And you, you, you talked about it kind of changed your filter, one of the first things before the book. And so I want to end on this thought. Um, you know, I think we talk a lot about creating the vision of what you want your life to be like, not what do you want to do? How much money do you want to have? What do you want your life to to be like. I think your life, if you want it and you really think about the true path to prosperity, it's going to involve happiness, it's going to involve fulfillment, and it's going to involve the uh, economy of success and money and things like that. But when you get really clear, and I, I tell the people on this podcast quite a bit, when you get super, super clear as to what you want in your life, that will create the filter that you go on. So instead of being on this path of needing money and then some event happens in your life that changes your filter. So now you're starting to think about this. What we're trying to do is get you to think about the fact that if you want a life of true prosperity, where you have happiness, fulfillment, and economic success, you will create a, a filter <clears throat> that you will use for everything you do. Are you going to spend more money on that car or not? Probably not if you want these things. Are you going to involve charity, service, you know, uh, connection with human beings to have that quality of life? You probably will. So when you have that filter up front, when you're working on your path to success, it helps you make the decisions instead of just wandering through life, making decisions one way or the other. So that's, uh, that, <clears throat> I'll tell you, that is a great topic. In, especially since we talk so much about marketing, economics, strategy, social media, and personal develop, even personal development and mindset, that's a topic that I'm super, super glad we had the opportunity to, to talk to you about today. And, I, and I'd like to, as we do follow-ups, have, have you on even more. So let's, let's end with this. Um, Dr. Danko, where can we have people find you online? Where can we send them for them to get more information other than obviously Amazon, pick up the book, Richer Than a Millionaire. You won't be disappointed. It's an amazing read. Where else can they find you and where's the best place for them to get some more information? 
Yeah. So yeah. So certainly, Amazon, other bookstores have it too. But look, it's 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 a lot easier to uh, go to Amazon. I'm not trying to make it hard for uh, independent mm-hmm. bookstores, but the reality is there's a lot of competition out there, and Amazon has it. Period. Yep. Okay. Yep. But you can also go to richerthanamillionaire.com. Um, Rich Van Ness and I created that website, and it has a collection of various uh, essays we have uh, written over the years and various interviews um, that we've engaged in. And, yeah, uh, I love that site, no, by the way. I, I will be a big proponent of that because I went through it. It had some really good stuff. You've got you know podcast articles, news, resources. There's some good things there. And by the way, we are planning, uh, for those of you listening, we are planning on um, getting uh, many, many, many copies of uh, Dr. Denko's book for our, our wealth summits that some of you are invited to. It's kind of an exclusive event, event around the country. So richer than a millionaire.com, obviously Amazon for the book. Anything else that you would want them to, to maybe go to to connect with you? Yeah, um, that, that's, I can give you my email address. Or is that going to be well, dangerous? Well, I'll, I'll, to put, I'll put some contacts <laughs> in, the, in the notes, but I think that's a great place to start. If they pick up the book, they go to Richer Than a Millionaire. That's a great way. We're going to help you to connect with, um, with uh, both, both Dr. Denko as well as um, you know, his co-author and some of the things that he has going if, uh, if you have an interest in kind of doing some more and connecting with him. So once again, thank you so much for your time. I know it's hard to get you because you have some great priorities in your life and it doesn't always involve speaking for me anymore or, <laughs> or those kind of things. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it. This is fabulous. This is fabulous, George. I appreciate it. Uh, you're making my, this time available for me, really. I, I thank you. Um, and, uh, you're and, and, and I really, um, I, I really wish the best uh, for all of uh, your listeners. Just as, you know, when I was in the classroom on a regular basis with thousands of students, I always wished the best for them as well. I really do. I want to see everyone succeed. And again, as we say, you can hear the message and then practice the contrary. But please internalize it. <laughs> yeah, don't practice the contrary. We'll, we'll end with the, the same thing that I generally will say, which is you absolutely have the ability and the greatness and the talent inside of you. And it is never too late to start living the life you were meant to live. And that includes putting these practical principles inside your life. So have an amazing day, everyone. And we will talk with you soon.